Hi, good morning. Um, I have received so much feedback lately and I'm glad and honored and grateful that so many different people seem to enjoy and learn from my lectures. Uh, so thank you all for letting me know and for asking interesting questions. Um, I don't always get to reply, that's just how it is, but you are appreciated. Um, I would like to say that I believe that these myths are a world heritage, one culture's expression of a very ancient and pan-human spiritual path. Like Stonehenge and the Sphinx and the Vedas, it belongs to all of us. There was one who said to me that um, he thought that my analysis of the Trimskvida, uh, you know, the, the story I told in the last video where Thor had to play the bride, he thought that it was a lot more credible that this story was about initiation and learning than an actual attempt to mock the god Thor, which is the official analysis given in any mainstream textbook. It is also how I was taught as a child, that the Norse religion was no real religion, that they didn't even really take their god seriously. So thank you Michael for perceiving that difference in the way I handle the Thor lore and for reminding me of an interesting subject. What was the Norse people's relationship to their gods? Um, I mean, uh, as I've made clear, the Norse pagan lore of the great, very popular and ancient god Thor actually gives the impression that this god is ridiculed and humiliated. But is he really? My analysis offers a reason for why this is the case, because Thor in the myths represent mankind and man's quest for wisdom, and honestly relates all the pitfalls and blind spots that may be encountered on the way. Maybe Thor is not ridiculed at all, maybe he's rather honoured for having paved the way for others to follow, and for letting all the aspect of his experience be a map. Uh, even when almost, especially when uh, it involves less flattering tales. Uh, to openly relate for the sake of learning or teaching and in retrospect and laugh at one's own stupidities in the past, uh, yet stupidities that were overcome, is not a sign of weakness. As I'm sure Thor would be the first to point out, um, it is a sign of real greatness. Um, so, I respect the faith of people uh, and I don't want to bash Christians or Muslims or Jews for that matter. I'm fully aware that any one individual's personal relationship to their God is varied and that any religion may have room for real spiritual insights and uh, the evolvement of the soul. Um, I also happen to think that the Norse mythology is not the only mythology where it would be fruitful to apply a metaphorical and allegorical understanding. I think that the Bible, for example, could also be read in this way, and there have been some attempts to do that. Um, but these monotheist religions have sort of been, in my opinion, hijacked by powerful political institutions such as the church and as such they have developed doctrines that tend to offer an image of God that is not necessarily the only way to perceive divinity, although these religious institutions claim that theirs is the only way. Uh, in these institutional faiths God has become someone, someone up there, um, far away from here, above, outside of creation, uh, better than us, higher than us, a million times more sacred than us, and we, his creatures, are lowly and bad and sinful and shameful, and our only hope is that God will have mercy on us despite all our lowliness, and for this purpose we are supposed to kneel and bow and beg and pray and display our utter submission and declare our uselessness and our guilt and so on. And this has, to an overwhelming degree, been the effect of the totalitarian institutionalized religion, no matter what the real and original spiritual message was really about. Um, and obviously, in this setting, there is no room for making fun of God at all. That is blasphemy, that is sacrilege, and if those institutions get their will, making fun of God will be severely punished. Uh, and since this has been the way for way of people for some time now, uh, it can be difficult to understand a previous tradition. 
a pagan tradition in which the gods are the object of funny stories and engage in all kinds of activities, even sex. It is easy when you think that God has to be an angry and humorless and strict old man with jealousy and supremacy issues to think that the Old Norse religion was no religion at all, obviously, since their gods were more fun. Um, this is actually the subject of one poem of the Poetic Edda, which is known as the Loka Senna, uh, meaning Loki's mocking. Uh, in this poem, all the gods and goddesses have gathered together with the immortal light elves in the hall of Egir. The nine daughters of Egir function as their light, and the gods try to entertain the old giant uh, while they wait for Thor to arrive with the cauldron of Hymir, which we talked about in the, the last video. And while they're waiting, Loki, the blood brother of Odin and the constant companion of Thor, arrives late and drunk and he kills the two servants of the gods called Fima Fenger and Eldi and those names mean cleverness and maturity. And that is obviously a metaphor because after having killed these aspects of intelligence and wisdom within himself um, Loki then approaches the gathering of the gods and angrily starts to accuse them of all kinds of lowly behavior Basically, the goddesses are accused of having immoral and casual sex outside of marriage, uh, whereas the gods are accused of unmanly behavior and cowardice. And this poem, where the gods are criticized, has been taken as yet another example of how, how empty the pagan religion was. Uh, what most people have not really paid attention to when analyzing this poem, however, is that the gods the gods do not attempt to deny the accusations, but they do stand forward, one after the other, and try to explain to Loki that he has not understood the real meaning behind these stories, and the result of his failure to understand the deeper meaning of the divine actions is devastating for Loki, because when Thor returns with a cauldron of wisdom that covers the totality of his being, Loki is expelled and ends up suffering terribly from the poison that he has created. I can go more in detail on this poem at a later stage, um, because this is not the subject today. Um, so, what kind of religion was Norse paganism? Well, when Christianity was introduced, people at first made the distinction between the new religion, which they called Kristin Domer, the rule of Christ, and the old pagan religion, which they called Heidindomer, the rule of Heider. The word Heidindomer is derived from the word Heider, which means brightness or heath, and which, by the way, was a common name for witches. And it was the name that Freya wore when she walked the earth at the dawn of time and taught the art of Seider to human beings and the gods. And I think that's interesting. But um, the term Heidindomer is usually understood as referring to the fact that this religion was usually practiced outside, in groves, in mountains and on heaths. Uh, later, when most people had adapted to the new faith, the old faith was remembered as Forenseder, the old custom. Um, I think that there was a great degree of flexibility in this religion. They were pragmatic people, they had an acute awareness of the universe as something highly mysterious, something even the gods had not fully grasped. Um, the great god of wisdom, Odin, does not stand out as a know-it-all. He stands out as a seeker of wisdom, one who never stops learning. Curiosity and openness of mind was the essence of wisdom. In the myths, Odin is learning, Thor is learning, Freyr is learning. This religion was not based on set doctrines. It was based on mystical experience and a consciousness about how knowledge always develops. Um, okay, so I'm going to tell you two stories about mystical experiences that I have had in relation to Thor. And let me first emphasize the fact that I do have an academic background as an historian and an academic approach to the mythology. I always consider the evidence and check my conclusions again and again and change it if necessary. 
uh, and check it with other scientists. But however, there have been times when I have felt that dreams and visions have actually helped me to a deeper understanding or have pointed out the way for me. And I cannot say whether this is just my subconscious working on material that I didn't manage to figure out in an ordinary state of mind, or if the powers really give me messages, or whatever. I don't know. And that really depends on what you are inclined to believe, and it doesn't really matter to me as long as it works. So I will just tell, this, tell you the story. Okay, so I was about 14 years... Um, it was about 14 years ago, I was not 14, I was in my early 20s and I was uh, living in England and I had just begun to seriously study the Edda. Uh, I had a very good Japanese friend and she suggested that we take a short holiday in York together and I said yeah sure and tagged along. I didn't know anything about York at the time. I did not know that York was an ancient Viking town nor that it was famous for its ghost sightings. There is possibly no place on earth where uh, ghost sightings are more common than York. Uh, people who never really believed in or thought they would see ghosts have reported seeing ghosts in York. They even have a museum about ghosts in York. Um, I didn't know this, but the moment I entered within the city walls, I felt like, wow, it's like this place has no real time, as if time is blurred together. I, I don't think everybody feel that way in York, but I did, and I kept looking over my shoulders, and I felt, I felt I kept seeing these historical scenes and images, and it, it was like time just became relative, and it was very, very odd, it made me very alert and nervous, edgy. Uh, we had arrived quite late, so the only thing we did uh, that evening was to eat and have a half pint of Guinness in a local pub um, because the next day we were going to go and do sketching and visit museums and stuff. So when I went to bed in the B&B I still had no idea about the Viking past or about the apparent ghost presence in York. I fell asleep almost immediately and then I dreamt. I dreamt of flying through York uh, looking for something that was hidden. It was a starlit night and uh, well the moon was dark uh, but it was lit up by stars and I flew and searched all over the place circling the city walls and then finally I found and realized what I was looking for. It was an ancient temple dedicated to the old Norse god Thor. And the temple was hidden below the ground, but as I recognized it, the temple surfaced, revealing itself to having been built in stone in the shape of a maze. A round maze. And I heard in my head a woman's voice say, This is Vea Thor's, Thor's sanctuary, and you will be initiated. Do you consent? And uh, I went, uh, Okay. And then I felt this pull towards the labyrinth. So I entered the labyrinth, flying just above ground, ground level, and as I kept moving through the maze, um, just like a little bit spirally, uh, and my body was gradually disintegrating, beginning with my feet, and then my legs, and then most parts of my torso. And you know, at some point, I only had my head and shoulders and arms left, and I knew that these two would disintegrate if I continued into the maze. And the more I disintegrated, the brighter everything uh, was becoming. By the time that I was disappearing, there was daylight in my dream, and I could see a huge green oak tree standing majestically in the center of the labyrinth. And as I felt myself disappearing, I tried desperately to hang on to something, and I grasped in the air with no arms to grasp with, really, and I called, I called my heart my center and I heard in my dream a woman's voice saying Thor is protection and I woke up I thought with a beating heart and her words still ringing in my ears but my trials were not over um, I was catching my breath and trying to feel whether I still had a body and then I felt something standing beside my bed just behind my own back and I felt my hairs rise and a cold shiver running down my spine because it was a black shadow 
I sensed that it was a black shadow that I had sensed earlier in the day, one of those things that had made me feel edgy and nervous. And I lay still for a while, hoping that it would go away if I ignored it and pretended that it wasn't there, but it didn't. Its oppressive energy was right there behind me, intent on me, focused on me, and it didn't feel reassuring. And I knew I would have to face it, so I turned around slowly and felt myself freeze with terror as I saw it. The ghost was... Um, it was a huge, dark figure clad in a, in a black mantle and looking perhaps like a medieval monk or rather because of the sword it was holding like some ancient warrior. And he held his sword with both hands pointing it towards the ground and he just stared at me. And I could not see his face, uh, it was shadowed by his hood and, uh, but I could feel his icy stare piercing right through me. And then I felt angry. Uh, and when I now say that I talked to him and even screamed at him, I didn't do so physically. My body was frozen, motionless, staring at the ghost. And perhaps I was sleeping and it was a nightmare, but it felt very real and I remember it very clearly. Uh, some part of me that was like myself in a dream rose up from, from my body and screamed anyway. And what I was screaming surprised me. Because I had never before then thought of myself as a witch. Never. But there I was and I was screaming, how dare you? I'm a witch. I'm a witch and I do not fear you. <laughs> Some part of my mind reacted to what I was saying with puzzlement. I'm a witch? Well, that was what I was screaming very assertively out loud with my dreaming body. I'm a witch, you bastard. Get the hell out of here. You do not belong in this room. And the ghost just remained there, staring at me as if daring me to prove my point that I was a witch and that I was more powerful than him. And he seemed to be mocking me and laughing at me and I could see his hands clutching his sword more tightly. And my, my thoughts raced through my brain until I remembered those words, Thor is protection. And, and then I just called him. I invoked the god. I heard myself screaming at the top of my dreaming lungs summoning Thor for my protection. <laughs> and then I felt a strange surge explode in my body and then I felt and saw this dark reddish thundering figure with eyes like glowing embers emerge from my own belly. Tall, huge, powerful and majestic. And he was wielding a weapon and as he emerged I could see the ghost actually take a step back. And then Thor suddenly became like a black and red wall of impenetrable energy around the bed, surrounding me like a fortress against the black shadow ghost. And you know how sometimes the mind just works very quickly, especially in dreams, and you can have a series of revelations and insights and feelings in very, very short time. Well, I had these insights. Um, one. This thundering, impenetrable, protective, massive, static, holding energy was the essence of Thor as a cosmic power. Two, it was also the essence of masculinity, of masculine energy. And three, this Thor energy, this masculine energy was, by protecting me, serving its true purpose. And at that realization I had a pang of grief because as a woman on this planet, and this is valid for women all around the globe, it has for much too long been a matter of life and death that we are cautious around men. Because men may potentially be dangerous and harmful to us. To us. Men may violate us and abduct us and use us and objectify us and imprison us and sell us and buy us and trick us and condemn us and punish us. And this awareness has been engraved into our hearts as an age-old truth, a matter of survival. Even the men that were closest to us could not automatically be relied on. The concept of relying on men for support and protection so that we may relax and concentrate on developing and teaching our wisdom to the children and nurture them with our love. That concept became empty a long time ago. It became a bad deal for us. 
Those who were supposed to support us turned against us and the wall of protection became prisons. I realized how much I missed real men, real brothers. And it was as if our brothers had been lost in some sort of violence and supremacy psychosis. And I realized why the goddess weeps. All over the world the goddess weeps. And in Norse myths, the goddess Freya weeps her golden tears because of the loss of poetry, the loss of spirit, and the loss of the sacred union and true partnership. And well, as these thoughts and emotions ran through me, I also made another observation that this energy, this essence of masculinity, had emerged from within me. And that was almost incredible because I didn't think that I I didn't ever think that I possessed that kind of energy in me. And I looked at it and I knew that even though it came from me or through me and that I was using it in some way, it was still the opposite of me. And that led me to the ultimate question. What am I then? What is my power? If this is the God, what is the Goddess? And then she came, uh, but not in any way I had ever experienced or imagined before. She came like the Thor force from within me, as a very real force of energy shooting through my body like lightning. And I didn't know that, uh, what Kundalini Shakti was then, but in retrospect I'm sure that uh, I had my first encounter with that uh, particular serpentine energy. Because it emerged from my root, from my womb, and then moved up my spine uh, in the shape of a double helix until it reached my head, which it simply blew open. And my head was open and a stream of blue electric energy that seemed to be shooting out of me like a, like a fountain. And it was the first time I experienced the goddess as something more than mild and blissful love. And I knew that this was the true power of the goddess, that this was what she really was. And as this immense power was contained within the walls of Thor, it started to circuit. I could feel my body suddenly give a jolt as the blue serpentine and lightning spiraled itself down through my body and out through my feet. And as soon as it had moved through me, it encountered the walls of Thor, turned and moved back into my feet and moved up again. And then she kept like spiraling her way up and down through my body and out through my head and back until I felt utterly, completely charged with electrical power that filled all my veins. And then I felt myself rising again, hovering above the wall and telling the ghost that he should be gone, because I was a witch and this was my power and I would wield it against him. And finally the ghost vanished. And then I felt the, the wall of protection that had been Thor descend back into my belly. And then I felt the lady gradually retire into my womb. Although I felt her electrical energy sizzle through me all night and I felt that for several days afterwards. I felt charged and wide open. And I was not surprised the day after to learn that York was an old Viking town and a, go uh, a ghost town. But I was very disappointed to learn that there was no known temple of Thor because I was certain that it must be there. I wanted to go and sort of give my thanks. But as far as we know, uh, it's not physically there. I'm sort of still expecting some kind of archaeological discovery. But Well, anyway, instead I spent the whole day walking around the entire city wall as a sort of homage. Now, this experience helped me in my research on Thor lore. A lot of my personal experience seemed to be highly compatible with the mythology and uh, in my second video in this series I talked about how Thor lore seemed to reflect some ancient understanding of electricity conduction and the electromagnetic field around Earth, of polar opposites coming together to create tremendous power. And all, um, and all that were things that I started to realize after this experience. And I found that I could scientifically argue most of the aspects of my understanding of Thor. 
Sadly, we know so little about Thor's wife Sif that I have to admit that my interpretation of her as being the lightning and the electrical power is based on some evidence and on reasonable deduction, but still the evidence is uncertain. It's not an incredible thesis, but it's impossible to prove with scientific certainty. But on a personal level, I am certain. And that certainty is based on my personal mystical revelation. And I'm also certain that my kind of experience was of the type that uh, the ancients would induce on a regular basis. And that also led me to think that things in mythology are not always what they seem at first sight. Um, okay. Second story. Many years later. I had begun my first attempt to write a book on Norse mythology and I struggled a bit with Thor. I had the electrical conduction theory going, but there was so much more to the lore of Thor. And then one night, I, after having spent the whole day reading through all the Thor lore of the Eddas, I dreamt. In this dream, I was suddenly before the great pagan temple of Uppsala in Sweden. And it was the Viking Age. And I knew that there would be a Thor statue inside and um, inside the temple. So I went inside. And I was met by an old woman who looked very much like a witch. With a staff and all. And I asked if I could see Thor. Since I had something to ask him. And she sort of stepped aside and made a gesture. And there I suddenly saw this middle-aged huge warrior standing there. His hair and beard was red and his eyes were like ember lights. And I stared at him and he stared back. And suddenly I felt a, a thought emerging from his forehead enter my forehead like an electrical jolt. And the thought he sent me consisted of three sentences. Thought is electricity. Mind is the conductor. I am the conductor. And I woke up and it was like everything suddenly came into place. I had to sort of grab my laptop and start writing. And I kept writing until the morning. And when uh, I later in the day looked at my notes, everything I had written as if in trance during the night made sense. And it opened up an entirely new realm of my understanding of the myths. And it began with certain knowledge that on one important metaphorical level, Thor represents the human mind, the conductor and filter of thought. <laughs> in the next video, I will present the analysis that I made on the trinity of gods inspired by that particular insight. Um, for today, I wish to sum up and conclude the story of Thor's initiation. We have seen how his journey started when he wanted to get into the land of the gods and realized that for all his manly deeds he could not enter. He was told to seek the guidance of his mother, the earth, and if that, and that if he did not succeed, she would die. And as we know, Thor's major purpose is to protect the earth, the mother, and Midgard, the world. At first he failed. As he tried to enter the island of immortality, he refused to let go of his preconceptions and his pride and started to batter the women who tried to teach him. Then he was presented with a bigger trial still, the loss of his hammer and the adaption of a feminine role, his polar opposite. And as he became the opposite of himself, he was able to grasp the power and now he was on his way. The next step was to dare to lay aside all the weapons and all his protection and walk unprotected into the unknown. Wise enough to seek the guidance of the mother giantess, he is given her ancient weapons and manages to win the second trial. The third step was to become like a young child again, entering the unknown. First, he's faced with the terrifying aspect of the feminine power, the giant ogress grandmother with 900 heads. But as he stands his ground and does not let fear take him, the, the gentle, guiding, teaching aspect of the feminine steps forth and offers him strength and advice. Then he manages to trick the frost giant who freezes everything 
and makes an effort to fish the world serpent and gets to look the serpent in the eye. And one stop here. Midgardr, the middle world, is the earth or the human world that Thor protects against the onslaughts of Utgardr, the outer world. But to every macrocosmos there is a microcosmos and on the micro level the middle world is human consciousness, the known. Because if you think of Thor as a metaphor for the mind, the human mind, then the world he protects is the consciousness, human awareness, what we know. And we know that the conscious mind is like a filter that puts all the impressions and thoughts and feelings that we experience into a certain order. That order is something we have learned, and it's often strongly cultural and becomes a framework of preconceptions by which we understand the world. And to protect that order, everything that does not fit into the framework is expelled or ignored. And if something really tries to get in very strongly but which does not fit into our preconceptions, we will often react with anger, like Thor reacted when giantesses reminded him of his mortality before he understood that he could learn from that. So, if we take this approach, we may reconsider the middle world serpent. That serpent, which has more than one name, in one poem he is called Fafnir, the Embracer, and he embraces the known world, forms a border against the unknown. He is the limitation of the human mind, a limitation against which Thor, the mind, has to fight. It is when Thor lifts the veil that uh, is the serpent of limitation, of illusion perhaps, that he sees it in the eye. Um, and sees his world start to tremble. It is when the known and the unknown meets that Thor can finally receive new knowledge. This is the point where he gathers the courage to steal the cauldron of knowledge and let it cover the totality of his being, so that he may arrive victorious to the banquet of the immortals. Um, that's it for today. Okay, see you.